Major funding was provided for this program by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Every family has a legacy. The story of the Kamaka Ukulele chronicles one family's legacy and tells the surprising tale of how a family business and a most unlikely musical instrument from Hawaii survive the test of time. It's the story of how the 20th century transformed Hawaii and why some things should never change. This is a story of choices and roads taken and how knowledge and values are passed from one generation to the next indelibly connected by strings of history and affection. My name is Chris Kamaka, uh, son of Sam Kamaka Jr. What my grandfather had started, what my father and my uncle carried and has laid the foundation, you know, for us as this third generation, you know, it's a real humbling experience, you know. I wouldn't call it pressure, but there is, there is some sort of uh, um, underlying drive there that that wants us to be successful, or, um, you know, all three of us, I guess, Chris, myself, and, um, and Freddie. But I think we've come together pretty well, that the goal is to, to be successful, or to carry on what was given to us. You know, we were given something that, that I think we really don't realize what it is yet, but I think we're heading in the right direction. We're the last of the original ukulele makers here in Hawaii. Um, so all those original family businesses that started out uh, same time as my grandfather in the you know, early 1900s, um, they're not around anymore. So we are the last of uh, the old breed of uh, ukulele makers. And we do feel the pressure to keep it going. It's evolved over all these years. And we've tried a whole bunch of different brace patterns on the inside, whole uh, thicknesses of wood, different types of wood, and we, and this is what where we're at, where we're at right now. Um, and not to say that it's probably will change, you know, in the future, but I think we, we're hitting it pretty close right now. And now we're just kind of refining um, some things. We're always changing a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there, but not too much to where it's to make too much of a difference that we didn't know what we changed. In 1879, three Portuguese cabinet makers aboard the ship Raven's Crag landed in the port of Honolulu. It's believed that the craftsmen Manuel Nunez, Augusto Diaz, and Jose Santo were the original builders of a new Hawaiian musical instrument, the ukulele. The simple four-string instrument proved to be enormously popular among Hawaiians, and within seven years, Ukulele were in full production in Hawaii. And so much about Hawaii, especially at that time, was, uh, was exotic to a mainland culture. The idea of islands and palm trees and the dress of, of, uh, of traditional Hawaiians over here was all entirely new and, and exotic. And so um, I guess Tin Pan Alley in those days, which was really where a lot of the songs began, for the mainland, um, because they were in a sense very sort of hit-oriented and novelty-oriented, whatever was popular at the time, they would kind of write songs for. Ladies and gentlemen, for your kind approval, we offer my new composition entitled, I Found a Little Grass Skirt for My Little Grass Shack in Hawaii. The mainland music influences constantly affected what Hawaii was performing as the pop music and the pop culture of mainland United States changed, our Hawaiian music reflected those influences. 
And now, for your pleasure, I wish to present Pua Alameda and his Polynesian. Hawaiian music was being performed by the first generation that had been taught English uh, more than Hawaiian in the educational system. In any event, when we're trying to perpetuate tradition and culture, you need things that represent the tradition, the, the heartbeat of our music or our dance, uh, whatever we're looking at. In the case of the uh, ukulele manufacturer, like Kamako ukulele, they're using the same techniques and the same dimensions and the same sound. And there, there are things going on elsewhere in the world which uh, are wild new inventions, but you can always depend on tradition and um, that pure sound that you're looking for with Kamako. In 1910, a young Samuel Kamaka apprenticed with Manuel Nunez and learned the craft of ukulele making. By 1916, the enterprising Kamaka was building his own ukulele in a makeshift factory in his basement. There existed two Hawaii's at the turn of the 20th century. One was rural farming-based, and under an ancient land system known as Ahupua'a. The other was a rapidly growing modern urban center. This dichotomy between old and new created for many in Hawaii an overwhelming sense of change and loss. But not for everyone. Sam Kamaka had a deep sense of being Keiki Oka'aina, a child of this land. But he was also a young man of the 20th century, and he didn't see any reason why he couldn't be true to both. Because the front of his shop was always open, and with the ukuleles hanging in the office, so when people could look in from the trolley and see what the instruments were, how the instruments looked. School let off at 2.30, we had to get on a certain numbered streetcar coming in, and we'd stop right in front. My father would be standing, as then we're looking at his watch. By golly, when that streetcar stopped at that certain time, his two sons had better be getting off that streetcar and straight into the back. When young Sam Kamaka began making ukulele in his basement back in 1916, his legacy was the last thing on his mind. Who could have imagined that this would become his life's work or the incredible journey the ukulele would take across America? Generally speaking, everyone is one degree of separation from a ukulele story or an ukulele story because they were so dominant in the 50s. Everyone had one. There were two companies in Chicago, Regal and Harmony, who were making just hundreds of thousands of ukuleles, usually with fun designs on them, with cartoon characters on them. Sometimes in really unusual shapes, there was the aero uke that, was, that looked like an aeroplane. And there was this big boom of interest in the ukulele. And I would say it kind of ran through much of the 50s into the early 60s. The whole time Kamaka was making instruments, a lot of makers dropped out when the popularity waned after uh, the 20s and the teens. Some came back during the 50s, waned again, and now we have another resurgence. And Kamaka made ukuleles the whole time. And it's, it's an amazing thing. He was the only Hawaiian maker left after about 1930 and he continued. He persevered through the good times and the bad. When Papa was dying in, uh, in uh, <clears throat> late 1953, I was in service in the Korean War. Sam was actually at school uh, working on his PhD in entomology at Oregon State. Um, Sam came back and, uh, to take care of my father uh, when he was very sick. He, did, he didn't know for sure who, if anybody was going to take over. And the evening that my dad felt he was going away, going to leave us, he asked, this was in Waianae, and he asked me to, to, to call Father. As soon as he gave my dad his communion, my dad closed his eyes and went off. That was it. When he died, uh, we found this little notebook of his that had in where he had loaned money out to these musicians who had got stranded all over the world. 
he loaned them the money to come home. Huh? And he put it in this little book, and they never collected. They got home and they all forgot about it. They never. They... So my brother and I looked at that. We said, you know, you know, we could, we could we could go after these people, but no, we just tore it up. And, because my father would never never wanted that to happen. In the beginning, I had to be every place. I was up, had to be up in the front office, and Jerry, wife, was working with me. He was awfully kind of hesitant about doing it, you know. But when he did it, it was perfect. I took the first ukulele to the House of Music, and the owner said, try it, and he, he loved it, and he says, I'll take everything you make. We were very poor in the beginning very poor. He would bring an ukulele home and have sold it and we'd just celebrate. When my brother retired from the military in the middle 70s, then he, then he joined me and, and I said, you take over the, the front office and uh, I'll keep charge of the, the manufacturing process. They would ride into work every day and they wouldn't say more than two words to each other the whole time. They just feel they know exactly what the other person is thinking. They're very close that way. Family means everything. And uh, this is how it's always been. And uh, this is how the company survived. The Roy Sakuma Ukulele Festival draws thousands of ukulele aficionados to Waikiki every year. Players and fans gather from around the world, and each one seems to have a story. I don't know how exactly my grandma, uh, my mom got it, but then she had it for a while, and when we started taking lessons, she said, it's his, so he left out. <laughs> yeah, I have one, uh, your brother. Uh, oh, you yeah. get to the shop, and you guys put a new back. Well, I, I stole it from my, my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> we only had one ukulele, but five of us. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's uh, I have my kamaka. I still have mine. I have a tena kamaka ukulele, and uh, and I I won't sell it because it uh, means so much to me. Oh, it's great. You know, it's it's fun because uh, especially this one because we had my my dad and my uncle there and, and some old friends you know came up and uh, talked to them and uh, it's just a real uh, happy time yeah. I think the ukulele is always in my mind that it's going to be part of the island culture All my life I've been playing my Hawaiian music not knowing the chords I like the sound of it Dad always kept making sure that we never forget that uh, the bottom line of the ukulele or the you know musical instrument is the sound. Um, if you can maintain you know the sound, the sound quality as best you can, and keep it as consistent as you can, then you shouldn't have any any problem. Let, let's face it, the sound is vibrating on the inside, and. If I were to demonstrate this uh, baritone here, now I'm also going to do the same thing with this baritone. Ukuleles are like children; they're all different. You know, they're not—they're not really the same. Everyone has its own personality. So now, 
This one here does not leave Oahu. Okay, so the sound is quite different. The big challenge was to get them to love what they, they, they were doing. So um, over the years, I've brought instruments that he had made and the music of their aunties, their, their grandmas. And that, that has inspired them. And, uh, and today when they bring the instruments that they're creating to me and I listen to the song, this is, they're making better the instruments than I have ever been. <laughs> he said that if you take over this business and you use the family name, don't make junk. We've implied the same thing to our sons who have uh, four sons who have now are running the business. We will always try, try to keep in mind when we try and do something that you know this is product that it was created before us and we're just here carrying it on to the next to the next level hopefully to make it better and to to uh, um, you know provide the players now with an instrument that is 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 better quality you know hopefully they want to keep it like how they've been doing it you know uh, everything hand built just keeping it like like uh, their grandfather did. You know, our instruments are designed to last, you know, a lifetime and to pass on to your, to your next generation. As my grandfather's used to come into the shop, you know, you see them and you go, wow, they're still together. Look at this, you know, it's like 85 years old or, you know, and they're still, and you still can play them. They sound great. So that's the kind of the, the focus too, is the longevity part of it. The big secret of anything is quality control. <laughs> and, but, uh, for us, and my dad was selection of wood. And koa has been a traditional wood that has been fabulous for us. It has a, a vibration quality. How you become um, relationships with the people you build instruments for. You know, they kind of, um, uh, give you an idea of what you want and, and then you're trying to put hey, Bart, their ideas know. into this instrument. Get some new logs. And so I kind of do that with the wood guys, um, the guys that cut us wood. And it takes a while sometimes to develop that, that relationship of knowing. Beautiful. You know, after a period of time with any customer, you develop a rapport and, and you kind of have an idea of what they want so that eventually they'll call you up and they'll say, hey, I want, you know, a hundred, 4A sets of tenors, and I know what they want. When you 
get a brand new instrument, you know, it's very important that you know the person who made the instrument. You know, because a lot of the the person that made the instrument, you know, their I mean, their their heart and soul is in is in this instrument. You know, and Casey really puts his whole self into everything that that he makes. You know, and 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 as a player, you know, when when I when I receive an instrument from him, I can feel that. You know, I, I really can, and 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 that that's really his gift. I mean, you know, I mean beyond the just just the craftsmanship and and his. Um, I mean, he really is a perfectionist, and the way that that he he makes his instruments. I mean, it, it, he's he's just so amazing, you know. But even beyond that is is really, you know, he 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 puts life into every instrument that that he builds, and that's something that you know that you can't learn, and and it's really it's really something that that is very rare, and when you come across it, I mean, it's 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 magical. On weekends, it's, I'm just here by myself, you know, and I can, I don't even put music on, it's just, just the quietness and hearing the, um, the uh, chisels or the, or the plane, you know, scrape the wood or the sandpaper and you can just kind of uh, get lost in there and just feel what the instrument is telling you when you're working on it. That's where the intuitiveness, I guess, would come in after, from watching um, my dad and the other workers all these years. There's a feeling that, that we always look for. Um, when my when my uh, dad used to tell us, you know, you, you've got to try and, and feel the sound. And it's kind of ironic because a lot of the guys that he had working before, you know, and still do, are hearing impaired. So it means then they are not listening for a sound, they are feeling a sound. And when I say feeling a sound, it means then if I did this, you would feel a vibration. And that's what these people do. Even 30 years ago, I don't think it was found to a great degree here. I think the, the family model uh, passing on of one uh, talent to the next generation, the family continuing doing it, these are pretty rare things. You know, you still see it in Spain and uh, to some degree France. Um, but it strikes me that it is at once old worldly and also very Hawaiian. Um, to just have this uh, unity of family. It's, it's a lot of work to try and keep up, uh, keep up that uh, legacy. Um, my father got me, uh, trained me up in the things that needed to be done to uh, work the business and I think he's, I think he's happy that uh, I'm in the business. I would hope he'd be impressed, you know, with, with what we're doing. I think he would. I think my dad is coming around a little bit on that. Pretty much everything uh, that I know I attribute to, uh, you know, my father. Um, as you as you know, he's so quiet and uh, just just by his example, you know, 
working alongside of him and uh, you know, being in his presence, watch how slowly you know, his hands would you know, handle the different parts and uh, how careful he is at listening and uh, just watching mostly. And he was a great teacher, still is. The fears I had learned Way back then I didn't know Not one deed meant unkind Nor one thought uncouth In the beautiful days of my Time quickly passed the years.